are we presenting today uh, on a trope which is so omnipresent that it could easily claim synonymy with what uh, is usually called modern Chinese literature, namely the trope of a woman suffering in consequence of historical circumstances, be they feudal oppression, uh, war atrocities, uh, revolutionary turmoil, or breakneck modernization. And these scholarly questions inspired by this ever-growing pantheon of suffering heroines have actually rarely ventured beyond the problem of politicization of the feminine, and in particular beyond the paradigm uh, of genealogy. So finding ruptures and epistemic shifts, like large scale events that change the way uh, the women, uh, have been, women have been imagined. So for example, in early 1990s, Tani Barlow made this foundational argument whereby she traced the ruptures between ideological formations, which determine how the woman was conceived conceptually. Uh, around the same time, Ray Cho criticized Per Link and C.T. Xia's readings of the so-called Mandarin ducks and butterflies fiction because, as she says, the issue of women does not become for them a point of rupture, an opening into a different type of reading. Uh, Louisa Shine similarly uh, says that the woman trope has been conceptualized as this key trope, a key signifier at historical junctures where modernizing was at stake. Uh, and finally, more recently, Wang Zheng, also a, a very influential scholar in the studies of Chinese feminism, uh, writes about grave historical ruptures in gender representation in China as direct results of power struggles in the PRC. So I believe that this unintended consequence of genealogy with its preoccupation with power and the belief that ideologies form is the neglect of continuities that actually span across these ruptures, events, or epistemic shifts. And I suggest that the tools of digital humanities can actually help us uncover numerous formal continuities that have been so far neglected in literature and may actually produce novel insights into gender representation in modern China. Mm. So genealogy, I believe, is not the only model of cultural change, even though it's very the dominant one. And perhaps it's high time we started looking for other better models that explain changes uh, more accurately. So one way of tracing continuity in a corpus of texts is to find words that appear again and again, despite ideological transformations. So if it turns out that there is a set of words that are immune to historical forces, at least within the time span that we are here interested in, then we will probably find a blind spot in the genealogical framework. Again, at least in the form of genealogy as it has been adopted in modern sinology. So we can use statistical tools such as measures of relevance. For example, here we have oh, just um, a simple equation showing the actual occurrences of a word or a collocate divided by the number of expected occurrences. We can also calculate PMI or pointwise mutual information, which is simply the probability of two words appearing together divided by the probabilities of them appearing individually. And for example, Fisher's exact test um, to ascertain how unlikely or how significant an appearance of a certain collocate uh, is. So there is a simple contingency table and then a few uh, equations can, can uh, help us find words that appear uh, unexpectedly often in a corpus. So these few statistical methods can tell us whether certain words appear more often than expected given their overall distribution in a corpus. And if it turns out that certain words appear again and again in different periods in descriptions of femininity, this will be our first indication that there is actually more continuity than allowed for uh, by the genealogical model. So these methods outlined here have been applied successfully in literary criticism by the Stanford Literary Lab, led by Mark Algie Hewitt, and I would like to acknowledge here Mark's guidance. But first, let me offer a more manageable single example. Uh, here, I will focus on the white-haired girl by Maonyu, and I will show how these few equations, few statistical tools can actually help us analyze this text. So this is an immensely popular revolutionary opera put together by He Jingzhi and his comrades in Yan'an in the mid 1940s. It was originally based on a folk tale about a, a woman, her name is Xi'ar, who was oppressed by the stifling customs of the old society and the landlord class. And it, this play very quickly became one of the most recognizable icons of the Chinese socialist culture. 
um, and a model opera actually during the great cultural revolution. So given this text specific economy as a uh, theatrical play, White-Haired Girl, I think, offers a highly concentrated distilled example of the woman trope that can be subsequently generalized into a larger uh, corpus, within a larger corpus. Okay, so as I said, the core principle of computational criticism is that a textual phenomenon can be considered significant if it occurs more often than otherwise expected. So one way to operationalize this insight uh, for White-Haired Girl is to calculate the frequency of each word that she or actually pronounces on stage and determine if she uses this word more often than otherwise expected, if it is her word. So here we see a table with a list of words that this algorithm has actually given me. And I also provide some translations in the next slide. So the most prominent collocates of CR include kinship, designations, and expressions that are strongly charged uh, emotionally. So the word yedie or father is or dad is by the most by far the most important term for CR. So although arguably all characters in this play have fathers, it is only for her character space to use the term originally coined by Alex Bollock. Uh, so it's only in her character space that this term becomes actually relevant given overall textual economy of the play. So other terms such as I, to hurt and death are also identified as distinct collocates by the algorithm contributing to this fictional image of Shi'ar, the suffering heroine. Um, so here we see how the evocations of her pain and vulnerability are repetitive, heavily dramatized and concentrated, calling for our immediate empathic involvement, like in the excerpt shown on the slide. And I would like to try to generalize this finding. So let's see if words like those that accompany CR portrayal of CR in the play actually occur and again and again in a larger number of texts. So how to generalize this? Um, I will consider three distinct subcorpora of modern Chinese literature containing novelistic texts, including short stories, novellas, and novels, full-length novels, from respectively the Republican period, uh, the socialist period, and the contemporary period, the post mao China. So an important additional pre-processing step involves changing all feminine uh, pronouns and female proper names to one word, woman. There are packages that allow us to guess whether a certain name is, is a fem feminine name or, or, or masculine name. I can get into that in the Q&A kind of in more detail. But afterwards, after we change all these proper names and, and uh, female pronouns into the word woman, we can actually compare different texts with each other and their, and their vocabulary distribution. So we can find words that appear more often than expected around the word women in all three subcorpora within a certain window, let's say five words to the left and to the right from each mention of the word women, and keep only the terms that appear in all three subcorpora. That will be the words that contain some kind of stable representation, the core representation of femininity, at least in the period in question. And this is what we get. So these are the words that appear more often than expected around the female pronoun and the female proper name uh, in each of the three subcorpora. So what is most interesting to me here is the presence of the vocabulary of suffering, although comparatively small, it is actually consistent. So female characters, again, not women as such, but female characters as they are represented in text, on average, they cry and suffer more than expected in every subcorpus, even in the socialist period, which arguably promoted a more kind of iron girl type of womanhood. And there's also a very strong presence of the familial vocabulary. Um, so the womanhood is always related to the family, even in the socialist period again, uh, which presumably managed to dissolve this, these family ties uh, according to the genealogical approaches, at least, and the more recent years as well. So this might seem just a confirmation of what we already know, but I would like to draw attention to kind of how these words are actually distributed in, in text. So the question is how the window size actually impacts the number of common collocates. And we can see here that as the window size, the horizon around these women words increases, the number of common collocates decreases. Um, there is therefore, I believe, a stability, stability of representation within shorter distances smaller window, more common words, and larger window, fewer common words. 
Whereas larger distances, tech, the, the, the words that appear further away from women, uh, signs in the text contain more text contextual information that is historically specific, and therefore it does not appear in all three subcorpora. So now the question is, how do writers manage to actually embed female suffering within vastly different socio-historical contexts? And I interpret the woman trope, therefore, as a kind of principal distribution of vocabulary. Uh, operating on these two kinds of distances, whereas any particular representation of suffering women relies on terms and expressions that appear within immediate proximity to the signs denoting the protagonist, so a proper name or a name uh, or, or a pronoun, the contextualization of the suffering occurs within much larger textual horizons. If the short distance information uh, activates our immediate subpersonal recognition of pain, the long distance information grounds its recognition socioculturally and is historically specific. And we need to take into account both dimensions so that they are taken into account in order to understand the powerful holds that the depictions of suffering heroines actually continue to exert on the Chinese moral imagination. And again, I think we can think of it in terms of a gradient actually. So there is a certain representational core that is very difficult to change. And there's the, the historical context so far, I believe the huge chunk of scholarship has focused on these long distance contexts, that is to say on this kind of historically specific information, very little has been said about short distance representation of, of femininity. So the question is, why is female suffering such a popular theme? Is it possible to write the women without mentioning the family, without mentioning suffering? What would this representation amount to? So if the feminist argument is that women should gain more independence and participate in equal distribution of power, these ch changes perhaps should appear not only within the context that is historically specific, but rather also within these shorter horizons of representation, of gender representation. Okay, so I'm kind of getting uh, towards the end of the presentation. I would like to show this two examples of how these short and long distance information is actually interwoven with each other in the novel. Uh, so in post-1976 China, the painful experience of the Cultural Revolution undermined the hopes of and aspirations of the Socialist Project. And in Xu Mao and his daughters, we can actually see the illustration of this collective disillusion. Uh, the text is set in 1975 and portrays a small village in the Sichuan province near a fictional Hulu Dam or Hulu Ba. And here the author Zhou Kaqin actually appeals to this mechanism of sentimental education that I'm trying to conceptualize here. He focalizes on the Xu Mao's fourth daughter, the, the Xu Xiaoyun, she is the new Xi'ar, uh, who is married against her will to a local party cadre uh, and then is raped by him. So this novel is very ironic because it shows that actually party members themselves inflicted pain on women which they're, who, who, who they were kind of presumed to, to actually help liberate and safe from oppression. Um, so here we can see how the text combines the subjectivity and language of the main character with the presentation of the narrator. And both free indirect discourse and direct natural interventions, I believe are technological solutions that allow the author to merge the personal with the impersonal, the short distance and the long distance information, and to transform the particularities of individual characters into collective allegories. And the same happens in a more recent text, which focuses on one, one other character um, who is actually forced to come back from the city where she worked as a migrant worker to the countryside to help her mother. And she is also depicted as suffering figure embedded within the larger context of rapid urbanization. Um, and here the text responds to the previous novel that I just discussed showing that women or for that matter, any person can suffer despite national prosperity which was the thesis of the previous work. Um, so individual happiness is, should not be entirely contingent upon China's economic standing. Okay, so to conclude, I believe that most uh, this thing collocates, this method I just showed here is, is, is a useful way of tracing cultural change and stability. Um, there is a continuity of gender representation. There are common collocates that appear in all three uh, subcorpora that I uh, consider here. In particular, there's familial and suffering vocabulary that appears in all three of them. And I believe that genealogical model is actually unable to 
uh, to account for such topological consistency. So I believe that we can think about cultural representation, representation of womanhood in terms of this distribution of information. On the one hand, we have shortest information. We chose the woman as a suffering figure, and it's represented through depictions of cognitive and emotional life, but it's resistant to political changes. And then we have long distance information that is historically specific um, and contains social contextualization that is actually vulnerable to political changes. And we need to pay attention to both rather than focusing on just the political side of gender representation. Thank you so much.